Good morning. It's my privilege this morning to read for you uh, the words of God found in Exodus chapter 24, first 11 verses that are on the screen, or you can turn in your Bible, whichever is your pleasure, to, to hear his word. Now he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab, and Abinu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people go up with him. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord, and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has said, we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. And he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. Then he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of the oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half the blood, put it in basins, and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people. And he said, All that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, This is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. Then Moses went up also, and also Aaron, Nadab, and Abinu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, and it was like the very heavens in its clarity. But on the nobles of the children of Israel he did not lay his hand. So they saw God, and they ate and drank. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word this morning. Thank you, Mel. We will at this time dismiss our children, ages three through kindergarten, to head downstairs to Itty Bitty Church. And the rest of us The rest of us will do our very best to echo the words of the Israelites. All that the Lord has said, we will do. By the way, we could use a little of that from a little of you. How many of you skip into church every Sunday? I can't wait to go. Just when Pastor Chad preaches, I'm sure. Before we really begin, Let me just deal with a portion of today's passage that we're most likely not going to delve too deeply into, at least today. We may revisit it next week, but I just want to pause just a moment and acknowledge verses 10 and 11. Moses has an infuriating way of understating things, doesn't he? Like talking shrubbery that's immune to fire, and he writes, So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. That's it. Nifty, a talking, burning, but not burning bush. Let's go have a look-see. Or a 40-year theophany, the appearing of Jesus Christ in a pre-incarnate form. And Moses says, so yeah, a pillar of fire and smoke was just chilling in front of us day and night. That's a paraphrase, but that's pretty much all we know about it from Exodus 13. And today's passage is another one where we might expect Moses to wax eloquently about his experience, but instead he simply says, and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone. It was like the very heavens in his clarity. So they saw God, and they ate and drank. Now, I could rant about this for a while. I mean, how do you just say they saw God and decided it was time for a snack? But I'm not going to rant. Instead, I'm going to return to this passage maybe in a little bit, maybe not till next week, maybe not at all. But uh, I won't return to it for the purpose of ranting about what Moses left out. Instead, I simply want to say this. I don't believe that Moses was being casual about all this. I think it was simply indescribable. And thus, Moses simply gives the little bit of detail 
And then he drops it, knowing that nothing he would ever write on a million pages would begin to capture what they experienced. And the whole reason I start with this is because I want to remind you that Jesus has declared where two or three are gathered in his name, he is there in our midst. I want to remind you that we don't come to church because this is the most comfortable chair in your world. Chances are the most comfortable chair I own is here at the church, but it isn't in the sanctuary. It's down in my office. And no, you can't have it. You don't come here because the chairs are comfy. I pray you don't just come here because the people are friendly. On Communion Sunday, I pray you don't come because we have donuts. Now, if that's what it takes to get you through the door the first time, fine, I'm good with that. Maybe you just really like the preacher, Pastor Chad, when he's up here. Well, either one of us would be the first to say that if we are the reason that somebody comes to the church for the first time, hey, we really like when our youth pastor preaches. We, we think our senior pastor is, is superbly adequate. You should come check him out. We'll be the reason they come the first time. But don't ever come back because the chairs are comfy the people are friendly, the donuts are tasty, or the preacher is entertaining. Come back because we meet here with the God of the universe. And it is indescribable the majesty and glory of the one who indwells his people. And we are, above all other people, as Christians, most blessed. For we can say, we have met with the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, forgive me, forgive us for ever diminishing you, intentionally or not, because it has become and will remain my greatest desire to make much of you. Let us stand in awe at what we see when we look to you through your holy word. May the indescribable glory of our Creator and Savior shine through us into a world that neither recognizes nor acknowledges your majesty or your authority. Bless our time in the Word. Reveal yourself. Give us understanding of your ways. Help us to know your covenants and to rest secure in your promises. Let us not come to this or any other passage merely for content, merely for information, but for revelation as you have chosen your Word to reveal yourself. And it is in your name that we pray. Amen. Well, we'll jump right into it today, and we will notice, first off, that access to God is restricted, is it not? In this passage, we find that God's invitation to his people to come and worship him. But the worship began with an invitation, and then scripture, and then offerings, and then a sacrifice, and only then did they approach. This must be the formula that we follow as well. We have each received an invitation to come before the Lord, but to do so, we must come according to His Word, bringing our offerings and entering the presence because of the sacrifice of Jesus. And when I say offerings, I don't mean we charge admission. I don't mean that you have to put something in the boxes at the doors back there. Romans 12 tells us to present ourselves, our bodies, as living sacrifices. We come to the Lord and we give Him of ourselves and those who know him are to give of our finances as well but that is secondary to giving of ourselves god desired the worship of his people he invited them to come but there were restrictions namely that the people could only worship from afar this was because they were sinful people now what i'm about to say is for christians only this simply is not a true statement for anyone who has not given their hearts to Christ, having accepted by faith his death on your behalf. So if you are not a believer here today, what I'm about to say does not apply to you. You are, in fact, in the other camp. But if you are a believer here today, let me say that all those restrictions between us and God have been lifted because we are no longer sinful. Now, any non-believers listening in person or online immediately shout in their mind, you hypocrite! I know you. I followed you down the road and you were speeding. I've heard you lose your temper. I've heard you say dumb things from the pulpit and elsewhere. You're just as sinful as I am. Well, not exactly. 
See, there's no hypocrisy in the statement that Christians are not sinful people because it is impossible to be a Christian without a well-developed understanding of our own depravity, our own sinfulness, our imperfections. You think I'm imperfect? Oh, let me tell you, I know more than you do about how imperfect I am. I would dare say I even know more about my own imperfections and shortcomings than my family. And they could make a list. They're not allowed to, but they could make a list. No, I'm not a hypocrite because I don't claim that I don't sin. And I don't claim that there's anybody in our fellowship of believers who is without error, without sin. As David put it in Psalm 51, my sin is always before me. So how then do I say without hypocrisy, we are no longer sinful people? Well, I'm not saying we don't sin. I'm saying that our sins have been removed by the sacrifice of Jesus. We can now come near to God. In fact, all believers in Christ will someday live forever at peace in his holy presence because Jesus has removed everything that separates us from God. His perfect life ending in a horrible death and given back to him in glorious resurrection, open the doors to all who believe in him. Now Christians can come boldly into his presence to worship, not from afar, but from the foot of his throne because we're no longer sinful, we're washed, fully, completely, and eternally clean. There is no sin in our account. When God looks at Christians, he sees the perfection of Christ. And that's the greatest news ever. But if you are not in Christ, I have the worst news ever. You are seen by God still in your sins. And those who are in their sins cannot enter the presence of God. And so we trust in the blood of Christ to wash us clean. And once having been washed... We never need to be washed again, though we come back over and over again to the cross. We come back for forgiveness, but that forgiveness was granted once for all. Coming back and confessing, that's for our benefit, for our good, to remind us of our need for a Savior, lest in our arrogance we might imagine that somehow we could earn it on our own. Moving on, we talk here in this passage about covenants. We've already explained some of the idea behind the covenants and the the form of the covenant. But as always, this covenant was signed with blood. This is called the ratification of the covenant. And as we learned last week, all covenants and all treaties during this time were sealed in blood. You would agree both sides have their, their say and then blood would be spilled as a symbol that if we were to break our side of the covenant, we become like this animal. Our life is forfeit, our own blood spilled out. But notice where Moses puts the blood, half on the people and half on the altar. This showed the Israelites, and therefore us, that this covenant was God's as much as it was theirs, and vice versa. It also showed them how serious God was about his people. God was willing to sign a covenant. And that willingness to take a vow to declare his very life and status as God was on the line should he break his word. That is an incredibly unprecedented, unheard of statement from any deity. (coughs) Excuse me. Of course, when when I say... When I say that that this was unprecedented to hear from any deity, we know that God is the only God. And all the little g false gods are make-believe or they're demonic. So God is the only God who truly speaks, let alone the only one willing to give up his godness, his very existence, if he ever breaks his word or fails to perform his promises. See, that's what God said in, in signing the covenant. He said, if I break my end of the deal, I will stop being God. I will cease my existence. I will forfeit my life. Not in the way Jesus Christ forfeited his life. He did so as a man. God himself says, if I ever break my word, I'm done. What happens to the universe if God quits being God? No. Unimaginable. 
It is interesting, too, that the sacrifice was equally God and man. The blood of the sacrifice versus the blood of Jesus. Here in this passage, they sacrificed oxen, and, and that sacrifice of oxen by the people of Israel was the first of thousands, probably millions of sacrifices. But this one in particular was to seal the covenant between God and his people. And the declaration, as I mentioned, was if I break this covenant, I will be like this ox. I will die and I will burn my blood having been spilled. That is the punishment for breaking the covenant. What is interesting is that God never broke his side of the covenant and yet he paid the price as if he had. Jesus, equally God and human, 100% of each, became the ultimate sacrifice 1,300 years later or so when he laid down his life on the cross. And there he said, this is my blood of the new covenant. The old one's been trashed. Every single person in the world has broken that to pieces. So we need a new one. We need to start fresh. The sacrifice of oxen here in in, in Exodus 24 sealed or ratified the covenant in blood, but there was a problem. The people of God broke their end of the deal almost immediately and often and repeatedly. And God could have immediately cursed them to death as soon as they broke the littlest part of his law. That was the deal they made that day. Their end of the covenant was either obey or die. They didn't obey, so they had to die. But they didn't, at least not immediately. Instead, in the fullness of time, in exactly the right moment, God eventually sent His Son, Jesus. And after a few hundred years of waiting, thousands really, if you go back to the promise of Genesis 3.15, from the time of the exile from the Garden of Eden, they were promised that someday a Savior would come who would crush the head of the serpent, who would destroy sin and bring peace once again between the Creator and the created. They've been waiting for this since the first day outside the Garden of Eden. The people hoped in the coming of the Savior. And so eventually He came. And now we have hope in the absolute knowledge of a Savior who did come, and in so doing He fully accomplished God's will. And he fulfilled both sides of the covenant that was made that day on Mount Sinai. So the new covenant is not entirely new. The new covenant is, let's do this again. Let's start over. God's standards haven't changed. His character hasn't changed. His expectations haven't changed. What's changed is our performance. Jesus Christ, on our behalf, never broke any part of the law. He lived perfectly within God's will, and then he took the place of all of us who haven't. He became the ox, and he paid the penalty for breaking the covenant, setting us free forever from the bondage to sin that the law represented. The ox wasn't good enough, but it was a symbol, and it was a a promise, and it was a powerful one at that, because the ox, well, the ox was a beast. He was unbelievably strong. The equivalent in some ways of of a train or a rocket ship today. This was the most powerful means of transportation known to mankind at that time. And even with all of its might, it was brought low. It was humbled. And it was slaughtered to appease the justice of God. Jesus, he was good enough. And though he is of the absolute greatest might... He came in weakness and submission, so his sacrifice was overlooked by many who were claiming to be waiting for it. The perfect sacrifice came and fulfilled the covenant and died for our disobedience. Unbelievable power, humbled to the grave. Now we're going to deal with the sacrifices in more detail next week, and, and we'll mention them again as we finish up Exodus over the next few weeks and months. But I want to take a look now at the two responses of the people. We've got verse 3, verses, verse 7. All the words which the Lord has said we will do, verse 3, all that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient, verse 7. And the first of the key words in this passage is all. First, we have to realize what it was the Israelites were agreeing to. 
Moses stood before them and he read the law of God. Basically, he read chapters 20 through 23 of Exodus. Now, to give you a frame of reference, we have spent, this is our 18th week. No, we did spend 18 weeks of our church time studying Exodus 20 through 23. 18 weeks. Moses stood and read them to the people without comment, just simply read them out, and the people said, yep, we're going to do all that. Even after 18 weeks of study, how many of you would say, I understand everything God said and meant in those four chapters, and I will obey it perfectly? Anybody want to throw your hand up? I didn't either. 18 weeks we studied, and we all go, I I still don't understand it. They were very quick. They were very quick to say everything. Oh, yeah, we're going to do all of that. The Israelites were agreeing in part because they knew how important these words were but also because they had seen God do some pretty incredible things. They were standing there before the smoking mountain that was the backdrop behind Moses. They heard the thunder of his voice. They did not understand the words. They heard the thunder. And so they were witnesses of what God had done, and they said, well, we'll give him the very best we've got. After all that he's done for us, we'll give him everything. Everything. But also, never underestimate the power of the group. There were somewhere around two to two and a half million people gathered at Moses' feet, and the overwhelming current of the culture would propel almost anyone to shout in agreement. It was a thing to do. It seemed like a good idea. It seemed like the least that one could do is to give lip service to the God who had gotten them out of Egypt, who had fed you and your family, kept your livestock watered in the desert, descended to earth to talk personally with your leader. Shouting agreement really looked like the only option, and everybody else was doing it. So let's just say, yeah, all that he says we'll do. Get back to the key word at hand, all. The Israelites promised to do all that the Lord had said. And we often say the same thing, right? Pastor Chad rearranges my pulpit when he preaches because he's, you know, exceedingly tall and uh, moves it so i had to find my bible how many of you believe this raise your hand if you believe this word oh i see the hands going up good how many of you believe everything in it how many of you know everything in it i'm not saying this to guilt you i think it is good that we declare our belief in god's word I believe that it's good that we say, hey, we believe everything in here. But I believe humility dictates that we say, I don't understand it all. I don't know it all. There are mysteries in here that will not be revealed while I'm in this flesh. But I will continue to dig. I will continue to study. I will continue to pursue that I might know my God better. His word is perfect. We believe in the Bible. If I were to say, hey, you know, by and large, do you, uh, do you do what God wants you to do? Most of us would say, well, yeah, I, I, I do what God wants me to do. Or I know what God's word says and I do it. But we understand there's some caveats there. We're not perfect. And if I'm being totally honest and brutally frank, this was a stupid promise on Israel's part. And it's a ridiculous statement for us to echo. We're doing it all. Every bit of it. Yeah. Uh-huh especially if our lives are literally on the line. So aren't we grateful? Aren't we grateful that we do not make it into heaven by obeying the law? We make it into heaven because Jesus Christ obeyed the law for us. There's no way that we can even begin to make such a promise. We can't claim to know everything God said. We can't claim to know every subtle nuance and principle contained just in Exodus 20 let alone 21, 22, or 23, not to mention the rest of Scripture. So does this excuse us? Of course not. Just because we don't know all that God has said in His Word, we're not off the hook. We are not judged by what we think or or know or understand or want Scripture to say. Oh, I want Scripture to say a lot of things. But we are not judged by what we know or think or understand or want Scripture to say. We are judged by the perfect law of God as He understands it and the bible tells us a single infraction is enough to disqualify us from his presence his friendship and his salvation if you have broken any part of the law you are guilty of all the law the wages of sin is death 
We know from Scripture that we are judged by the perfect law of God as He understands it, and every infraction disqualifies us from His presence. Let me see your sad face. It's the worst news ever. But here's that holy however I just love so much, right? Everything is awful. Everything is hopeless. Every chip is stacked against us. And God says, <clears throat> however. But we are not judged by what we know, think, understand, or want Scripture to say. We are judged by the perfect law of God as He understands it. But Jesus perfectly obeyed, upheld, and performed mankind's end of the covenant after an eternity of upholding God's. Jesus Christ God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, the three-in-one Godhead has, since eternity past, perfectly upheld His Word. And He will not stop upholding His Word. For eternity future, He has always obeyed His own covenant. But Jesus came in the flesh, became a man, and He perfectly upheld our end for us. So thus, we are not judged by how well we uphold God's law as He understands it. We who have trusted in Jesus Christ are judged by how well God, in the person of Jesus Christ, upheld the covenant, which is flawlessly. We're judged by His performance. Now let's talk just a bit about the law. We are dealing with the law as we deal with these chapters in Exodus. There's much more law to be found in Leviticus and Deuteronomy and elsewhere. But I have had several conversations with lay people and even other pastors who express shock and surprise when I tell them we're studying the book of Exodus chapter by chapter, verse by verse, through the whole book. And then I tell them there's a guy in our congregation who already did this once with me. Right, Joshy? He still comes back. I don't, know what, I don't know what brings him here. He's been through Exodus with me two years. We spent in Exodus a few years ago at a different church. Josh was in high school then. He probably slept through most of the sermon. Yeah, I know. He still does. <laughs> there are people who are shocked that we're studying Exodus. Why? What's in there that applies to us today? There is a huge problem in the modern American church. Most Christians don't believe the law matters anymore. But this couldn't be further from the truth. Dake's annotated reference Bible says the New Testament references the law 1,050 times. <clears throat> so for all of your Christian friends who spend all of their time here in this New Testament, do you understand that in these few pages, and this includes the index and the maps, and that stupid map of Exodus is wrong, in here, 1,050 times it references this 1050 times the new testament references these three pages exodus 20 21 22 and 23 the law absolutely matters but for those who are christians we are covered by grace in other words the law still reflects and reveals god's desires his expectations his standards his character at the judgment seat of Christ, we will be judged against the law and our shortcomings will be called sin. And those sins will either be forgiven for those who, have, who believe in Jesus and have asked Him to take our place and to extend to us His forgiveness, or they will be held against us, disqualifying us from heaven and sending us to eternal punishment in hell for any who do not receive the forgiveness of Jesus. We are not judged by what we know. Remember this exact same slide. We are not judged by what we know think, understand, or want Scripture to say we are judged by the perfect law of God as He understands it. But Jesus perfectly obeyed, upheld, and performed mankind's end of the covenant after an eternity of upholding God's. Now some of you are still trying to believe that the law doesn't matter anymore. We live under grace. Well, that's true, sort of. The law of God still remains the standard by which we are judged, both the letter and the spirit of the law but it is our performance of that law that has been substituted with Christ's. Talked to two different, uh, two different men this week 
both Christians, both believers, both strong men of faith, both men that I would trust with the Word of God, both men that I would, I would absolutely, without a doubt, put in leadership of a church. Both, I found out just this week, convicted felons. Well, what do you mean? Yeah, I mean, our sin disappears. I know people. I was just talking, uh, talking to a man who, who, who worked in a prison for a while. We got to talk about prison ministry. And I said, some of the strongest believers I ever knew I met in prison ministry. Actually, he said that first. I said, I know, I met some of these guys. When I did prison ministry up in uh, Prairie du Chien, the very first, uh, first day I was ever there to do their chapel, I said, would you do me a favor, gentlemen? Would you just please never tell me? First of all, I know you're innocent, right? I know you're in, every one of you are in here, and they all laughed because they knew that's the line. Oh, I'm innocent. I said, but don't tell me what the state said you did to get in here because if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, that does not matter, and I don't want to judge you by what does not stick to you anymore. You see, our performance of the law has been substituted. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of Christ. Somehow, with all the dirtbaggery I've managed to pack into almost 47 years of life, God looks at this this horribly broken and sinful idiot that stands before you. And all he sees in me is the perfection of Jesus Christ, not because I've earned it, but because he gave it. And if you're here today and you've been convicted of a crime, the cross makes that invisible to the only judge who matters. If you're here today and you have been unfaithful, you have had an addiction, you have been a liar, a cheater. If you can list your dirtbaggery for page after page after page, but you have come to the cross of Christ, the only judge that matters does not see that because your performance of the law, which is hideous, has been replaced with the performance of the law by Jesus Christ who is perfect and flawless. I need to get back on my notes here. We're going to be here all day. He took credit for our failures. He died a sinner's death. We receive credit for his perfect fulfillment and we live eternally as the heir of God in heaven. Is that fair? Absolutely not. It is not fair to him. Is it a deal I suggest you take? Yes. Yes. You are hearing right now the invitation to trade your sin for his righteousness. Your death sentence for his eternal life. It ain't fair to him, but it is a lifetime offer. Once your life is over, it can't be taken again, so take advantage of it right now and let your eternal life begin today. For a Christian to claim that the law doesn't apply to us anymore is contradicting the clear words of Jesus in Matthew 5, 17 to 19. Don't think I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill for assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of, these, one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. The tittle was a decorative swirl added to Hebrew letters by the scribes. The jot refers to the, the yod, the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. By confirming the constancy of the smallest letter composing the law and even the decorations of a letter, Jesus affirmed that his coming did not nullify any part of the law. The new covenant was, in fact, the old covenant fulfilled <clears throat> and perfectly performed by both sides. <clears throat> Jesus was challenged of his view on the law in Matthew 22. And we look here at an exchange between him and a Pharisee. We're going to look at verse 35 through 40 and one of them a lawyer asked him a question testing him saying teacher which is the greatest commandment in the law jesus said to them you shall love the lord your god with all your heart with all your soul with all your mind this is the first 
and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The first greatest commandment is taken from Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. It's called the Shema. The second greatest commandment is to love one's neighbor as oneself. And interesting, this commandment is not listed in the Ten Commandments. But it's much later in the Law of Moses, Leviticus 19, 18. And this point is significant because it confirms that the Law of Moses, not just the Ten Commandments, is required for the New Testament, the church assembly, us. In verse 40, Jesus verified that all the laws and the prophets hang on these two commandments. The Apostle John, big advocate of the law, John 15, 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Past tense, I have kept. Was the New Testament written yet when Jesus said this? No, it was not. So when Jesus says, I have kept, He meant the, the commandments of the First Testament. 1 John 2, 3 through 5. Now by this we know, that we, lo- uh, we know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. He who says, I know Him and does not keep His commandments is a liar. The truth is not in Him. But whoever keeps His word, truly the love of God is perfected in Him. By this we know that we are in Him. To know Yahweh is to o- obey Yahweh. Many of those who say, I know the Lord, don't understand that there's more to knowing the Father than simply saying, I have faith. To know the Father is to know and to do His will, to obey. We cannot obey if we do not know what He has commanded. Second John, verse 6, This is love that we walk according to His commandments. This is the commandment that you have heard from the beginning. You should walk in it. Well, He wasn't talking about Matthew 1. He's talking about Genesis 1. Jesus, uh, John said we're to walk in the commandments that we have known from the beginning. Now, other so-called Christian theologians try to make Paul into a great champion of the abolishment of the law. Oh, Paul didn't believe in the law anymore. There are those who would say Paul taught the law no longer matters now that Jesus died and has been resurrected. But this is an intentional misrepresentation of Paul's writings. Paul's point was not that the law didn't matter, but that it could no longer hold us in bondage to sin. He understood that the law identified sin. Without the law, we couldn't know what sin was. Therefore, the law serves as a means to bind us, to enslave us to sin. We have been set free from sin by the blood of Jesus Christ, so the law, as perfect and just as it is, can no longer serve as a chain holding our sins to us. This is perfect. And the law reveals God's perfection to us. And it reveals our sinfulness, our depravity, but remember when I said it was just these three pages? Hey, I opened right to them. These three pages. All right, this, these two pages and the one that I can't get a hold of. Remember when I said these three pages just can't stick. They just fall right off. Because Jesus Christ has so perfectly fulfilled them. Every violation of the law, every sin has been charged to Christ, so the Christian's chains are broken, but the law remains. We see this be true in places like Romans 3, 19 through 31. (coughs) Romans 4, 13 through 15. I'm not going to take the time to read those two. Also, and and these verses will be on the screen. Those last two were lengthy, they didn't fit. But I urge you to take the time to look them up and study them this week. Romans 6, 15. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? Certainly not. That's Paul's way of saying, well, should we just ignore the law? Like just do whatever we want to do? No! No, certainly not, he says. Romans 7, 1 and 7, 12. Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. Therefore, verse 12, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Paul didn't want to abolish the law. He said the law reveals our sinfulness, and Christ has taken that from us. The writings of James, the brother of Jesus, the head of the uh, Jerusalem church, says this. He says, But the doer, be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks in the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. James 4, 17, Therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. We need to know the law of God. We need to seek to obey it. Those parts 
that reveal our sin and God's character. If we fail to know the law, we sin. If we know the law and fail to obey it, we sin. The only way out is to know the law and to obey it. Now, lest we misunderstand and think that we are bound to obey every ritual, every sacrifice, or every word of the law, Paul makes it very clear that it is the spirit of the law we must uphold. Sacrifices, rituals, legalism, they do no good. Instead, it is the state of the heart that pleases or displeases God. So you don't need to have to wear blue tassels on the corner of your cloak. You don't have to sacrifice any animals. We have one perfect sacrifice. We don't have to do all the ritual things that made them presentable to God, but it is the spirit of the law. 1 Corinthians 7, 19, circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Some excerpts here from Romans 10. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We are not saved because we perform the law. We are saved because we have faith in Christ who performed the law for us. And I mentioned earlier Romans 3, 19 through 31, but we didn't read it all. But look at Romans 3, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. We aren't saved because we obey the law. We look at the law and go, oh man, I need to be saved. I need a savior. I go on and on, but I'm going to end with this well-known admonition from Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. When we get to heaven, when we get to heaven, one thing I guarantee won't be happening. Nobody's going to be walking around going, I got me here. I did this. This is me. I deserve to be here. Matter of fact, I think there are going to be a couple of surprises on the day we arrive in heaven. I think we're going to be shocked at some of the people who aren't there, who put on a good show, who obeyed the law, who were very moral, but never gave themselves to Christ. I think we'll be shocked at who isn't there. I think we'll be really shocked at who is. But, but, but that guy, I saw him. I know what he did. Yeah. But he knew what Christ did. Moving on. Oh, we got to fly. I got to stick to my notes better. Verses 3, verses 7. I could have written that, you know, comparing verses 3 and 7 or verse 3, verses, verse 7, verses, verse 32, 8. That would have been a fun one, but now you're all wondering what verse 32, 8 is. There it is. These people promised, hey, we're going to do everything. Verse 3. Then in verse 7, they say, we're going to do everything and we're going to obey. And then even though it's many chapters later, it was just the, really the next chronological thing was when they made the golden calf. So verse 3, Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments and all the people answered. One voice said, all the words which the Lord has said, we will do. Verse 7, then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people and they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. Notice something in verse 7? Three more words were added, right? What happened in 4, 5, and 6. See, it's not until we recognize the consequences of sin and the cost of approaching God that we truly begin to see the need for obedience. See, after hearing the word of God, the people were ready to obey in legalism. Oh, all that he said, we're going to do. But after experiencing the sacrifice, after being sprinkled with the blood, after seeing the oxen slaughtered, and realizing that that is the fate they deserve. 
They don't want to just be legalistic servants. They want to give true obedience. And there are millions of people in this world, especially in this country, who say, well, I try to live by the good book. That's got to count for something. Yeah. Maybe. Much rarer, though, is a person who declares, I will diligently and fervently study God's word and discover his truths. I will obey so Christ's death for me was not in vain. You see, because wide is the path that leads to destruction, and many enter through that gate. But narrow is the road that leads to life, and few enter. There are a lot of people who say, yeah, you know, I try to live by the good book. True believers say, I want to know the good book that I might know the good Savior. When we become aware of the cost and we're covered in the blood of the sacrifice, the knowledge of the law is driven home to our hearts. When we experience for ourselves the sacrifice of Jesus, we go from lip service to heart service. We worship, we obey, we honor because we have been sprinkled with the blood of the Lamb. When we come face to face with the price of our sin, suddenly the law convicts. And we have no, no hope. And we cannot help but cry out to the Savior. Well, we're going to pick up next week with some further discussion on the sacrifices. We're going to take a look at the meal on the mountain whatever else the Lord leads us to study. But for now, I need to bring this full circle and just put some rubber on the road. And there, there are many applications for us in today's passage. I want to simply mention two. Empty promises, especially ones driven by cultural expectations and spiritual highs, they're dangerous and they're ineffective. Now, I like contemporary worship. I like, uh, I, you, you know from the, the experience we have downstairs, I, I think there's, there's a great deal of power in having proper lighting and, and kind of an atmosphere, but be very cautious. When you enter into a worship scenario where the clear goal is the manipulation of your emotions, because it will bring you to a place where you are going along with the crowd saying, everything they say will do. I don't know what it is. Nobody actually taught me anything out of the word of God, but by golly, I sure really am on a high. But worship, no matter its style, no matter the lighting, no matter the color, no matter the instruments being played, worship that reveals the sacrifice of Christ and brings us to a knowledge of our sinfulness and His perfection that glorifies the God who took our place, that is the worship that pleases the Lord. And He doesn't care about tempo. He doesn't care about style. He doesn't care about clothing. He doesn't care about instruments. What He cares about is are my people aware of my sacrifice on their behalf? The gospel, as I've said many times, is the complete story of God and man, the relationship that is meant to exist between the two and the impossibility of establishing, repairing, or maintaining that relationship on our own. And so the gospel tells us the lengths to which God has gone to reconcile himself with his creation. We have to come face to face with the sacrifice of Jesus and our sin which led him to die on our behalf. And we have to come to that over and over and over again. Let me clarify because there's nothing more important you will ever hear than this. Jesus Christ didn't die over and over and over again like the sacrifices of the Israelites. But we must come over and over and over again to the cross where Jesus died once for all and there be reminded of the cost of our salvation. Not because we can lose our salvation, but we can certainly lose our passion for the Savior who gave it. Secondly, we must never forget that we're covered by grace, but we must live with the constant knowledge that it is our sin, identified by the law, that makes that grace necessary. To know God is to know His Word, to love God is to obey His commandments, and we can do neither, if we do not make the study of God's word and the pursuit of his will a lifestyle. Let's close in prayer. Lord Jesus, sprinkle us with your blood. In fact, do not merely sprinkle, but cover us. May your sacrifice on our behalf so permeate our being that we radiate the gospel. May our obedience come from a deep knowledge of our own depravity and sinfulness and never an attempt to gain your favor. May we rest secure in your promise 
and all of your promises, enshrined in a covenant sealed by your blood and with the undeniable knowledge of your death and resurrection that gives us the absolute hope of your return. It is in your name we pray these things. Amen.